Good morning. I'm uh, Tom Licata. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, one of the elders here at Grace. Uh, one of those privileged to get a chance to speak while Mike is on sabbatical. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Uh, probably a familiar passage to many of you and one of my favorite verses. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, verse 2, but we'll read uh, start with verse 1 for the sake of context. So if you're able, if you could stand with me as we read God's Word. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And Lord, as we look at your word now, we just pray that your spirit will uh, speak to our hearts will open up to us what your word means and give us a desire uh, to do it. Lord, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I see this verse, verse 2 here, I sort of divide it into three parts. The first part is that we are not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed. Now, a dictionary definition of the word transformed uh, would be to change in condition, nature, or character. So going by that, we are to be transformed or we're to be changed in our condition, or our spiritual condition, in our nature, and in our character. That's we're transformed. Now an interesting uh, passage to go along with this is in Matthew chapter 17, verses uh, 1 and 2. Now this is where, this is the transfiguration, where Jesus was um, transfigured, if you recall that story. In 17 verse 1, it says, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Now, Jesus' face shining like the sun is reflective of God's Glory, As we learn in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when Paul was talking about how Moses, coming down from the mountain, his face shone with the glory of God, and they had to put the veil over his face, remember, so they would not see the glory of God fading. So we know this, this shining of the face is, is, um, is reflective of the glory of God. Well, Jesus' face shone like the sun. And what's interesting about this passage is when it says he was transfigured before them, that word transfigured is the same word as transformed in Romans 12.2. So we put those two together, and what you get is that our lives will be transformed uh, by more and more reflecting the glory of God. That's how we're to be transformed. If you look at um, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it says, and we... All, and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And again, that's the same word transformed there. So beholding his glory, we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. So in Romans 12, 2, Paul talks about being transformed. But in uh, 2 Corinthians, he, he gives a little more detail about what he means by being transformed. We're transformed more and more from one degree of glory to another, rep reflecting God's glory more and more in our lives. Now, that word transformed, it's a, a verb, and it's a very interesting form of the verb there. It's a present passive imperative. So the present tense means that it's, uh, it means like a continuous action, um, as opposed to just a one-time thing. Now, when you're... Uh, when you're converted and become a Christian, yes, you are transformed. Uh, but in another sense, uh, we are being transformed. It's a continuous action. So it's a process that takes place throughout our lives. But then it's in the passive voice. Now, a verb that's in the passive voice means that the subject is being acted upon, as opposed to the subject doing the action, which is kind of the normal way we think of a sentence. But in the passive voice... The subject is being acted upon. In this case, we, being the subject, are being transformed, obviously by the power of God. So we're being acted upon in that sense. 
But then it's in the imperative mood. Now, the imperative is a, is a command. So anytime you have something in the Bible in the imperative, it is a command which implies that this is something that we are supposed to do. It's the imperative, it's a command, that, you know, so we're supposed to do it. So you've got both uh, dynamics going on here. It's in the passive voice, which means that you know, we're being active part. We are being transformed rather than us doing the transformation. And yet it's in the imperative, it's in the form of command as something that we're supposed to be doing. Interesting, huh? Kind of a really unusual form of the verb there. I just take it to mean that, you know, we do our part. We follow, obey the command as best we can, understanding that any spiritual growth or benefit is going to be because of the power of God working in our lives. So in this passage, in this verse, it says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed, reflecting more and more of the glory of Christ, and that will result in, dis- in being able to better discern the will of God. But all those things are dependent upon the renewing of our minds. The more I studied this verse, the more I realized that that's all what it really came down to is that one phrase, the renewing of our minds. Because you see, we are not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. That's how we are transformed. And it's this, this process of being transformed or new, by the renewing of our mind that results in our uh, better understanding what is the will of God. But it all comes down to that re- being renewed in our minds. The Bible has a lot to say about the mind. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. In Colossians 3, 2, it says, set your minds on the things above. And I could probably give you about 10 other verses that talks about that. And so uh, this, this living for God, this walking by the Spirit, it all starts with the mind. It starts with the kind of thoughts that we think. And so that brings us to really the theme of my sermon, which is that to become more Christ-like and reflect God's glory, we must renew our minds. So I'd like to answer two questions in regards to this. Number one, why does it begin in the mind? And secondly, and probably more importantly, how do we go about renewing our minds? Well, first off, why does it begin in the mind? In Colossians 1.21, it says, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. So, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind. So before we came to know the Lord, our minds were alienated from God. Our minds were hostile toward God. In Titus 1.15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. So again, outside of Christ, you have a mind that is defiled. In Philippians 3.19, it says, Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So a mind outside of Christ is, is a mind that's alienated from God, is a mind that is hostile toward God, it is a mind that is defiled, it is a mind that is set on earthly things. So no wonder we need to be transformed. But you know, the thing is, you read these passages and you think, wow, my mind is, is gutter, man, it's slush outside of the Lord. But you know what the thing is to the world, it doesn't, it doesn't appear that way. These thoughts of the world, you know, thinking worldly thoughts, it doesn't seem so bad to some of the world. Even to Christians, because we are so often influenced, it doesn't always look that bad. And that's why we need the Bible to kind of set us straight. Before um, I was a Christian, well, when I was in sixth grade, uh, in in our sixth grade class, we, we read a story by Mark Twain called The Story of the Good Little Boy. And this is a story about a boy who always wanted to do the right thing. And then there were the boys in the neighborhood who were the bad little boys who were having a lot more fun. At least from my perspective, they seemed to be having a lot more fun. So for instance, the bad boys, would they saw a blind guy uh, walking down the street, so they went and they pushed him over and they ran away and they thought that was so funny. And a good little boy decided he's going to go help this, this blind guy. That knocked. So he goes over to try to help the guy and the blind guy starts hitting him with a cane because he thought he was one of those kids that knocked him over. You know? and, then, and then the, um, the story... Um, it had a lot of little instances like that. And the story ends where these, the battle boys tie the tails of these dogs or something together. And 
So the good little boy decides he's going to go and tie those tails and help. And of course, these dogs just chase him all over the place and, and he's never seen again or something like that. I think they find parts of him all over the place, whatever. Kind of gruesome, but it was supposed to be a funny story. And I thought it was funny. And I identified with the bad little boys because I wanted to have fun. I mean, who wants to be some stuffy good little boy always trying to do the right thing? And that's really the perspective that Mark Twain was coming from. Well, in eighth grade, um, I look at that as when I really became a Christian. There was one day in eighth grade uh, where I was just home and I was just kind of walking around. I was really kind of struggling with things, struggling with some of my thoughts, struggling with temptation. I, and I finally decided to pray about it. And I realize now that that was the Holy Spirit moving me because I never really prayed about stuff like this, but I decided to pray about it. And as I prayed, I remember at the end of that prayer, just all of a sudden feeling the peace of God, all these temptation, everything I was feeling was like just gone. And I remember coming away from that prayer thinking, wow, this is real. You know, all the stuff I learned in Sunday school class, I've been going to Sunday school class and all that kind of stuff. And I believed it, at least intellectually and stuff, but suddenly it just seemed so real to me. I don't even remember what I prayed. I just remember how I felt after the prayer, how I just seemed to, you know, experience in the peace of God. And I thought, wow, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go read the Bible. Suddenly I had this urge to go read the Bible, which I never had before. So I remember that day I started reading the Bible, and every day after that I started reading the Bible. And that Sunday I was, I was um, looking forward to going to church, which I hadn't before. I was in, uh, of course, junior high at the time, and the, in the church I went to, we had two services, and the junior high group met the first hour. The high school and that group met the second hour. So all my older brothers were going the second hour. Mom was going the second hour. I always had to go first hour. Our church was close enough for us to walk. And I never wanted to go. My mom would always come into my bedroom and wake me up, and I'd had to get dressed in a suit. In those days, I always wore a suit to church. And, and uh, to me, they were the most uncomfortable clothes I had. But that's what I had to wear. And I would stay in bed. I usually got up early on, on days I didn't have school. But on Sunday, I stayed in bed purposely, hoping that my mom would forget. And then, then it would be too late. And I, oh, darn, Mom, sorry, I overslept. Um, but she always came in there and woke me up and, and got me to go to church. Well, I remember after this experience, I was actually looking forward to going to Sunday school. And, uh, and I was going to surprise my mom. And sure enough, when she walked in there, I was already up getting dressed. And I can think, oh, you're up already. And go, yep. And the interesting thing was that this eighth grade year in my English class, we were studying Mark Twain, and we studied this story of the good little boy again. But this time, unlike a couple years earlier when I read it, I read it with a whole different perspective. Suddenly, I found myself identifying with the good little boy who wanted to do the right thing. And before, I thought it was kind of funny. Now, as I was reading, I was getting a little bit frustrated with the way Mark Twain had kind of written it. And the reason I saw it in a whole different light is because I had a whole new mindset now. Now that I knew the Lord, you know, I'd been transformed, and I had a whole new mindset, and I saw this story in a different light. I mean, that's just one of those, and I could give you several illustrations. It's just sort of illustrated how I saw the world differently, how I, how I had this new mindset. Because when we become a Christian, the moment you become a Christian, you're a new creation. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So we're a new creation. We immediately have this new mindset. And that's because we now have a new nature. And with this new nature now, we can choose to walk according to the new nature. And we now have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And we can now choose to walk according to the Spirit. See, you couldn't do that before. Before you were a Christian, you walk according, according to the old nature because that's the only nature you have. You can't be walking according to the Spirit because you don't have the Spirit. So you're walking in, in the ways of this world and doing what seems to be right to you in your own eyes. But now as Christians, you know, it's like the veil's been removed. So when you become a Christian, you're a new creation. But even though you're a new creation, we have this, this new nature and we have this new Spirit. Nevertheless, you're still a babe in Christ. And just like a baby needs to grow up, uh, we need to grow. Remember that word transformed, it's in the, the present tense. It's a continuous action. It's a, it's a process. We've started that process. In one sense, we're immediately transformed, but in another sense, it's a process we have to continually grow. Now, unfortunately, that old nature is still there. We can choose to walk in the new nature, but there still is that, that pull of that old nature, and sometimes we give in to that old nature, and we think thoughts along the lines of the old nature. So when you get angry at someone, 
uh, the new nature says that you need to forgive that person. But sometimes we give in the old nature and we kind of wallow in our anger and this kind of a thing. Because again, it's a struggle. And so, uh, and sometimes it's actually easier to just kind of give in to the old nature. Sometimes that seems more like the natural tendency. That's why it says broad and wide is the road to destruction. Not only because more people go on that path, but I think it's just an easier path to take. And, you know, narrow is the path that leads to salvation. And you have to make that effort to walk in that straight and narrow path. And so I think what happens is as Christians, we want to walk in that straight and narrow path, and oftentimes we do, um, but sometimes we give into that old nature. And so uh, we have, you know, obviously a lot of Christians have one foot, uh, you know, on that straight and narrow path, but, you know, we also sort of keep, you know, one foot on that other path, you know. We're not totally giving up, you know, that old nature. And so we try to walk both paths sometimes in life. And I, I imagine these paths are sort of splitting off. And the, the longer you try to walk both paths, the more you're likely to fall on your face. Well, the Bible has a term for something like this. In Psalm 119, 113, it says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. A double-minded person, a person who's of two minds. James has something to say about this. In James chapter 1, it says, starting with verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him uh, ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. See that if you're on that straight and narrow path, you're heading in the path and the direction you should go in life. But a double-minded man, someone of two minds, sometimes you're going down this path, sometimes you're going down that path, and you're like a, a, a ship that instead of heading in the direction it should, gets tossed to and fro in the wind. And what's the answer to that? Well, James tells us in chapter 4, verse 8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And that's the answer. You need to purify our hearts. We need to purify our hearts of all those things of the old nature. And then, you head, then you'll be heading in the path you should be heading in life. Uh, think of it like a compass. You know, a compass always points north. That needle always points north. Uh, and I used to use... Uh, a compass before we had GPS, that if I'd get lost while I was driving, I'd pull over someplace, I'd pull out my Thomas Brother maps, you know, whatever, and see the nearest cross streets, and I'd find that place on the map. The top of the map, of course, is always north, so I'd use the compass to properly orient, uh, you know, the map as to where I am and get my bearings as to what direction I should go in. But let's suppose that compass now there's some metals around it that have a, a magnetic pull to it. It's going to mess up. That, that needle's not going to point in the right direction. You first need to clear away all that metal and all those other things that are messing the compass up so that it points in the proper direction. And same thing in our lives. As we purify our hearts, more and more our lives will then be pointed in the right direction. But again, uh, because we have that old nature and the new nature, it's always going to be a bit of a struggle. So that brings us to our next question. How do we go about renewing our minds? How do we go about renewing our mind? Well, I'll give you uh, three suggestions. Number one, we need to remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God. In Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, you have the uh, children of Israel who are returning to the land. They were conquered by Babylon because they'd been sinning and all that. But after 70 years, they returned to the land. And so in Nehemiah, it talks about how they rebuilt the walls. And at one point, they they gathered all the people and they were reading... um, from the book of Moses and, and from the law, remind the people what God had said. And they're reminding him of what the mistakes their forefathers had made. And they were praying a prayer. And in Nehemiah 9.17, as they were praying, they said they, and the they's referring to their forefathers, said they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. New American Standard NIV would say they did not remember, they did not remember 
the things that you had done. They didn't remember the things God had done for them. And because they didn't remember what God had done for them, they ended up going down the wrong path. And we can do the same thing in our lives. If we remember what God has done in our lives, it helps us stay on the path. If, um, uh, that's one reason why I think it's good to, to journal, to keep a journal, to remind us you know, what God has done in our lives. In 2 Peter 3.1, it says, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. I'm stirring, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, by reminding you of the things of God. Now, the longer you live, the more you're going to go through times, you know, through tough times. Those times you just get on your knees and you're praying, you know, God help me, God get me through this and this kind of a thing. And again, if you live long enough, you've, you've gone through that time and you've, you've experienced that God did get you through it. Somehow, some way, maybe it wasn't how you expected, but somehow God got you through it. And the longer you live, the more you go through those tough times. That's just the way life is. And you get on your knees and you pray again. But you see, as you get older, then when you go through those tough times and you're praying, you're not as worried, you're not as anxious because you can remember in the past when God's gotten you through it. He got you through it before and that gives you more confidence that he can get you through it again. You can trust him. You can trust him if you remember what God's done for you in the past. If you don't forget. If we forget, you know, all those times in the past that God got us through it, then just like the Israelites, you know, we go through tough times and suddenly we're all worried and anxious again, forgetting that God's gotten us through this many times. And a mind that is anxious and worried is a mind that is conformed to this world. Because a mind, it's a mind that's not focused on God. It's focused on the circumstances. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a mind that's not focused on what God can do for us. It's, it's focused on, what, on me and how I'm going to try to get myself out of this fix. And so we get all worried and we get anxious. And so we need to remember what the Lord, our God, has done, and, and we need to keep our minds on the things above, which brings us to our second point. Set your mind on the things above. Set your mind on the things above. In Colossians 3, 2, it says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Now, notice he doesn't just say in that verse, don't set your minds on the things on earth and leave it at that. That wouldn't do us much good. Because you can't not think about bad things by telling myself or telling yourself, you know, you're not going to think about bad things. Uh, I had a, a youth pastor once to illustrate this point. He said, now, I don't want you to think, do not think in your mind about a little red-faced monkey. Okay, well, what did you think about? Red-faced monkey. Now, do not, whatever you do, do not picture, do not visualize in your mind this furry little red-faced monkey. Well, you pictured it again, didn't you? And no matter how many times I tell you, don't think about a little red-faced monkey, that's what you're going to think about. But if I say instead, think about a yellow banana, well, that's what you picture in your mind, right? You know, um, Martin Luther King once said, you can't drive out darkness with darkness. You can only drive out darkness with light. And so we need to think about the good things in life. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, take every thought captive. That, that uh, makes me think of a battle. You know, when, you, when you're in a battle and you take prisoners captive, that's the kind of language it uses here. Take every thought captive, but it's a battle. It's not always easy. And uh, sometimes I struggle with this, especially if I'm having angry thoughts, you know, and I shouldn't be having these angry thoughts, you know. What do I do about it? Well, I'm supposed to pray about it. Turn to Philippians Chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let's say I'm angry about something. Uh, I'm a school teacher, so, so let's say I had a bad day at school, and some kid just gave me a hard time, and I'm angry about this, and I'm thinking about this, and getting all angry. Well, I'm not experiencing God's peace. You can't be angry and experience God's peace at the same time. The two are mutually exclusive. So what am I going to do about this? Well, I know what the Bible says. It says, you know, be anxious about everything, but, you know, pray about everything. 
So I'm going to pray about this. Lord, I just, I just want to pray about Billy. You know that how Billy was not doing his assignment like he was supposed to? You know, Lord, how when I talked to Billy, he gave me back talk, and he was giving me a hard time, and I had to give him attention, and Billy's always giving me you know, a hard time. He's always a pain in the neck. You know? And I find as I'm praying about this, I'm getting all angry again. Because I'm thinking about the situation that made me angry, you know, and as I think about it, you know, I start feeling this anger again. And so afterwards, I'm going, Lord, you know, what is this? I'm, you know, if I pray about it, I'm supposed to be experiencing your peace. It seems like it's just the opposite. I'm getting all angry because praying about it is making me think about it again. What does that mean it doesn't work? Well, you know, the problem is, of course, I'm focusing on the wrong things. And I think Paul anticipated people like me, which is why he said, now look back again what it actually says. 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Oh, wait a second. Now, was I praying with thanksgiving? No, not at all. I wasn't thankful for... I, you know, am I supposed to be thanking God for Billy? I certainly wasn't doing that the last time I prayed. But maybe I should thank God for this person. You know, why? Well, God put him in my classroom for a reason. You know, he must have a purpose there. God didn't always say he was going to make my life easier. We're supposed to thank God for everything in Ephesians 5.20. And you can also thank God for what he's going to do. Sometimes God answers the prayers where we want. Sometimes he doesn't, but he always, he always works things out. And you, know, can, you can thank him in advance for what he's going to do. And also by praying with thanksgiving, showing that gratitude toward God, because that's what giving thanks means, it helps me put things in proper perspective. Because you see, in the grand scheme of things, uh, this is probably isn't going to be all that important, you know, a thousand years from now when I'm with the Lord. In fact, most of the things that we get angry and upset about you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, from a perspective of eternity, it's probably not really all that important uh, if we keep that proper perspective. And we pray, when we pray like that, then the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. You know, when I was in college, in the, in the college group at our church, they gave us a list of things that uh, we were to, uh, you know, um, categorizes what was the most important thing for us. And they had things like uh, being successful, uh, graduating from college, you know, having a, a good marriage, finding that right person to get married, because most of us weren't married yet, or you know, making a lot of money, this kind of thing, or happiness, that was another one on there. But the one that got the most votes was the word peace. They had the word peace on there among these 20 things that they listed. And most everybody was putting down peace. Because more than anything else, we want to experience God's peace in our lives. And Paul tells us how to do this. Look at um, verse 8 in chapter 4 of Philippians, if you're still there. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen me practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So we need to think about these things. And see, but Tom, that's not always easy. It's not always easy to think good thoughts. Sometimes I'm always wondering, Lord, what are these things that are wonderful and love that I'm supposed to be thinking about? You know, it's always a struggle. Well, let me give you a suggestion. Fill your mind as much as you can with good thoughts and good things, and you'll find it easier to think good thoughts. So in other words, read you know, the Bible every day, if you can. Try to read Christian books in addition to that. If you like reading novels, which I do, try reading Christian novels sometimes. If you like listening to music, try listening to Christian music. Now, you can't always 100% of the time be listening to something that's quote-unquote Christian. I mean, obviously, we live in the world, and uh, there's going to be those things of the world that we'll see in here. I'm not saying you have to become a monk or a nun, but as much as you can, to the extent you can, try to fill your mind with good things, and you'll find it easier to think good thoughts. As it says in Isaiah 26.3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And then thirdly, we need to have a humble mind. Uh, if you're still in Philippians there, turn over to chapter 2. And in verse 3, it says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he's describing Jesus, that we are to have the mind of Jesus, a mind that is ours in Christ. That's the kind of mindset we're to have. And what mindset is that? Well, he describes the humility of Jesus, this, this humble mindset Jesus had, where he was in the form of God, he was God and is God, and was in the position of God, but he gave up that position of God. He didn't cease to be God, but he gave up the position of God and to live on earth as a man. So he's describing how Jesus humbled himself, how he was the example of the kind of mindset that we are to have. Now, humility, I think, is one of those things that it's, it's, we kind of know what it means, but sometimes it's hard to define. In C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, Mere Christianity, in the chapter, he has one chapter on pride. And he talks mostly about pride. Um, and he kind of implies that the reason he talks more about pride than about humility is because he's got more of a handle on what pride's all about. Um, but at the, at the very end of that chapter, he does say one little bit about humility. He says, I wish I had got a bit further with humility myself. If I had, I could probably tell you more about the relief, the comfort of taking off the fancy dress, getting rid of the false self with all of its look at me and aren't I a good boy, and all of its posing and posturing. To get even near it, even for a moment, is like a drink of cold water to a man in a desert. Do not imagine that if you were to meet a really humble man, he would be what most people call humble nowadays. He would not be a person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. If you do dislike him at all, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. And that last line there, I thought, wow, that, I think, captures it. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. Because, you see, humility is not about how you think of yourself. It's about the fact that you're really not even thinking about yourself. Again, look at um, what Paul says in, in Philippians 2.3. Do nothing from rival right self conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, that each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul is describing what humility is there. And then he gives Christ as an example. Now, Christ humbled himself, came down here to the earth. I mean, obviously, Christ didn't come on this earth for his own sake. He came down here for the sake for you and me. And that's what humility is, that kind of a, that humble mindset. You know, thinking about God, thinking about glorifying Him, thinking about others and how you can serve them, having that mindset. So, so how do we renew our minds? We remember what the Lord, our God, has done for us. We keep our minds set on the things above. And we have that humble mindset. And all of this result. In, no, in better knowing the will of God. The result of all this is that we will know the will of God. Again, as it says in, in Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that what? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now again, we can use Paul as an example. He, he knew and understood the will of God. And it wasn't always because God gave him a direct revelation. Now, obviously, God did that. But sometimes God didn't. An interesting verse is in 1 Corinthians 7.25, where it says, Now concerning the betrothed, or concerning the virgins, depending on your translation, he goes, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. So a lot of what Paul wrote in his epistles were from a direct command from the Lord. God had given him a command, had given him a direct revelation of what to say to the, the churches that he was writing to. And, but here, the, the Corinthians had asked him uh, one of these questions, and God had not given him any direct revelation on this. So he just simply gave his judgment uh, as one, he said, who's, who's by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. In other words, why was Paul able to discern what was God's will in there, even without a direct revelation? Because he was doing exactly what he was telling us to do. I don't believe Paul just gave us words. I believe he actually practiced what he preached. When he says, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, I believe that's exactly what Paul did. 
And Paul said, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I believe that was true of Paul. And Paul's saying, you know what's going to be the result if you do this? Let me tell you, because I'll tell you from personal experience what's going to be the result if you do that. You're going to better be able to know the will of God. I think he's just uh, giving uh, his own uh, experience. An experience that you and I can also experience. See, we're not going to have a direct revelation from God the way the apostles did. But we can offer our bodies a living sacrifice. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind, just like the Apostle Paul. And just like the Apostle Paul, we can better discern what God's will is for our lives. Even in our daily lives, you know, um, for example, let's say you're reading the word daily. The more you read God's word, the more it gets into your mind. The more it becomes part of your thought process. One time years ago, I used to live in a townhouse. And in this townhouse, uh, you know, we had a pool. So I was swimming in this pool this one time. And there was these two kids, these two brothers. And they were, you know, the older brother was giving the younger brother a hard time, just kind of ragging on him and pushing his head under the water and this kind of thing. It was kind of bugging me. You know, and, and what bugged me even more is the father was just kind of sitting on the side of the pool and one of these lounge chair things, just kind of sunning himself, whatever. It seemed like he could care less. And it was bugging the father. I felt the father should be telling these kids, you know, to, to you know, act up and fly right, you know, and, and, and behave. But he wasn't saying anything. He wasn't doing anything. So I was about to say something to this father. And just as I was about to say something, this proverb popped into my mind, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Well, I'd been reading through the Proverbs at that time. So again, this proverb sort of popped into my head. I took that to be from the Lord, so I remained silent. And, and God can use his word like that. You know, these verses, if you're reading his Bible on a regular basis, you'll find Bible verses just kind of come into your mind that can sometimes apply to whatever situation you're in. So the result, again, is a life that with the increased power in perceiving and instinctively knowing what God's will is and what we should do, and this is our reward uh, for, for doing what Paul's uh, telling us to do here. To quote Alexander McLaren, the uh, great preacher of the 19th century, he says, to know beyond doubt what I ought to do and knowing to have no hesitation or reluctance in doing it seems to me to be heaven upon earth and the man who has it needs little more. So here in this passage, we have the way, perhaps the only way, that we can really change ourselves to the renewing of our minds by constant contact with the truth, by being willing to fight that battle of keeping our minds always thinking about ourselves and to focus more on God and how to glorify Him and to focus on others and how to love them and how to serve them. And it will be a battle, make no mistake, but if we're willing to fight that battle every day, then we will be transformed more and more to the likeness of Jesus, reflecting more His glory and that will result in a clearer and deeper insight into the will of God for our lives and the direction that He wants us to go in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word and thank you for the guidance that it gives us. And Lord, we just pray that, again, not only will your spirit and by your grace will we be able to understand what your word says and what it means, but that you'll give us a heart and a desire to want to actually do it, Lord that we will uh, be willing to fight that fight every day, Lord, and uh, that we can more and more be transformed into your image. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.